So as we approach Christmas, many of us will be gathering with our extended families, and there very well may be somebody in your family who would cause you to say, let's say it together, there goes Christmas. Oh, no. Is that person coming this year? There goes Christmas. Now, for heaven's sakes, don't look at them right now while you're saying that, okay? That, that, that's not going to help Christmas at all. Now, I don't know if you're into genealogy or not. I talked with Jerry Rupke last night on the phone. Hi, Jerry and Ruth out in their car. Um, but uh, he does this whole genealogy thing, and he, ca- he came to find out that he's related to Susan B. Anthony. So that was cool. And I said, well, Rupke's a, a, a German name. Are you related to Hitler, too? He says, well, I haven't gotten that far back in mine, you know, so, but uh, Maybe. So, uh, and again, I don't, I don't know, some, some folks are into it, you know, it's kind of dangerous to go back in time to figure out who you were related to. I mean, if you're from Texas, you know, you might be related to some bad people back there in Texas, you know, some, some people who, uh, you know, ran, ran the Alamo or something like that. You know, who, who knows who we're related to. But um, if, if you're, uh, again, what, what, what good does it do on the one hand to know who some of your relatives are, because I know really what we're trying to do is trying to figure out if we're related to somebody that's famous, and some of you have found out, I found out with the Labontes, they used to be Labontes, and now, so we have a Labonte, Maria Labonte, and Labontes, and they were at one time the same name, but now they, I guess they don't get along, so that one of them changed their name, and so we've got that, so... Um, again, if you find out that you're related to some notorious bad guy, then probably you want to just keep that, you know, a secret. You know, you don't want to let anybody know that your great, great, great grandpa was this horrible outlaw. But um, we've been talking about how Matthew started uh, writing about the life of Jesus. And he knew he was going to write a story that would impact people like for thousands of years, at least a couple of thousand years, the, the Gospel of Matthew was written, and we're still reading it. And Matthew chose to start the Gospel of Jesus Christ through Matthew with a genealogy. And, you, you know, we kind of read through that. Sometimes we've read through that, and if you read through the Bible and you read through that genealogy, and it's kind of like, who gives a rip about you know, he begat her, and he begat him, and he begat, and we begat, and, and then we kind of move on to get into the Christmas story. But Matthew was intent uh, in showing that Jesus was related to Abraham, Abraham, the father of the Jews. He wanted to be sure that they, they knew because he was writing. Matthew was a Jew, and he was writing to a Jewish audience who are very skeptical about who Jesus is even to this day. But he, he wanted to be sure that they knew, everybody that read the Gospel of Matthew knew that Jesus was related to Abraham and, of course, that he was related to King David because everybody in those days knew that the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one of God, would be in the lineage, in the family line of King David. So it was important that Jesus was related to all the right people. But, but as we're discovering, discovering, Matthew not only listed all the right people, uh, he also listed some of the R-rated characters in Jesus' family. He listed some people that normally you would just skip over or, or leave out or hope that nobody finds out about that person. Now, why, why would Matthew do that? Why would he include some hooligans in this list of Jesus' lineage? And, and we're going to look at today one of those gals who's known by a, a nickname. And as soon as we mention her, you'll go, oh yeah, she's the, yeah. And so when you get to heaven, you're going to say, hi, I know you're the, oh, okay, yeah, that's all gone now, isn't it? That's all changed. So we want to ask the question, what's your nickname? What's your nickname? What are you known by? And just because your name happens to be the same as a famous talking horse doesn't mean... 
That's not funny. What are you laughing at? <laughs> yes, some people call me Mr. Ed because of that famous talking horse way back. You have to be old enough. Some of you are going like, what is he talking about, Mr. Ed? Yeah, a horse is a horse, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, Matthew included some folks in Jesus' genealogy that were really messed up. Uh, We looked at Tamar last week. Was that kind of a new eye-opening story for you? And Tamar and Judah, and it's like, wow, there's a mixed-up family. It really was a creepy story when you think about it. You don't want to read it too often. Now, what, what do really messed up people have to do with Jesus? Exactly. Exactly, because they're just like us. So we, we begin to get what Matthew is pointing out, and I wrote this at the top of your insert. You can fill in the blanks there. Sinners are part of the Christmas story. In fact, they are the point of it. Jesus same he said he came to save sinners. He came to seek and save those who were lost, those who were far from God. And the Christmas story is the beginning of Jesus Christ and his, his mission on earth to reach people who were far from God, reach people who were really messed up. Now, again, Matthew was writing to a very religious group of people, the Jewish people, very religious, but who, who didn't believe that there were two ways to approach God, which Matthew is about to introduce here. The, the Jews only believed that there was one way, one way to God, and that was based on what I have done or my self Righteousness, and there are many religions today that still propagate that. It's up to me. If it is to be, it's up to me. If I'm going to get right with God, I have to do things right. I have to, I have to, I have to. It's all about me. All world religions basically are are, uh, are based upon this approach to God. What I have done and what I have not done. God is looking down on me, and if I do this, he smiles, and if I don't do that, he frowns. And he might even get out a stick and slap me or something. Uh, It's what allows us to approach approach God and ask for his help. We approach him, uh, again, based upon all the good things. God, I went to church today, so can't you do something for me? Well, God, I gave a dollar, or I gave a hundred dollars, or I gave... God, I, I did my part. Can't you just... And we try to bicker and bargain with God. We're no, we know we're not as good as some people are, but we aren't as bad as other people, and we're hoping that God will grade on the curve. And so we're better than the bad, not as good as the good, and what does he expect from us? So a big problem with this is, and again, Matthew knew this all too well, is that if our standing with God is based upon our own self-righteousness, our our own consistency in living a good life, doing the right things, then for some people, they just assume it's game over. I don't have a chance. That's where Matthew was at. I was a tax collector. I mean, this was the worst of the worst. We're never going to be good enough for God, we, we figure, and so we'll never experience peace with God forever. So we're just going to do our best. We're going to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and we're just going to suck it up through life because I'll never be good enough for God. So as Matthew begins to write this greatest story ever told, the life and the teachings of Jesus, the Messiah sent from God, Matthew wants us to know that there is another way to approach God, a a better way. We, We can approach God based on what Jesus has done based on Jesus' righteousness, his righteousness. Matthew wants us to know that Jesus didn't come uh, to this world just to collect all the good people, all the religious people. He came for all people. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his son. That includes you and me and everyone sitting in this room. We can approach God because of what Jesus has done for us. 
Jesus came as the Savior of the world because he knew that we needed to be saved from our sin, all of us. He knows none of us is perfect. He doesn't expect perfection from any one of us. In fact, do you know any perfect people? I don't think so. And if you think you are, there's a problem. God wants us to have a relationship with him. Jesus came for us because he is for us. He's for us. He's not out to get us. He's not waiting to catch you doing something wrong so he can say, gotcha, and now you can burn. That's not God. That's not the story of the God in the Bible. So as Matthew lists these folks in the genealogy of Jesus, he's reminding us of the fact that all throughout history, God has extended his grace and his mercy to people who have not deserved it. Again, just like you and me. The reason that they're part of the story is because they are the point of the story. The reason they're part of the Christmas story is because they're the point of the Christmas story. And the reason that you are a part of the story is because you too are the point of the story. Jesus came for you. If you'd have been the only person that needed a Savior, he would have come for you. I hope that makes you feel real special, real important, because you are to God. That's why he came. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Oh, that's why we celebrate. Really? What about all the trees and the tinkle and the lights and all the, all the, all the uh, did I just say tinkle? And not, yeah. <laughs> Twinkling lights. Maybe there's tinkle going on, but... Um, <laughs> somehow we get lost in all the stuff and forget the meaning of Christmas. So Matthew begins by telling us a story about this gal whose name is Rahab and that God chooses Rahab. Let me read you the story. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Really important. Son of David, son of Abraham. He's, a, he's the right guy. And then he goes into this. Abraham's the father of Isaac. Isaac's the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. You remember from last week and Okay, and all that whole deal. Um, Judah's the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Okay, we talked about her last week. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. That's not the Los Angeles Ram, by the way. That's a different one, okay? Uh, Aminadab's the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now, if you've been around uh, church at all very long, you've probably heard about Rahab, the Jewish audience that Matthew first wrote this to, when they get to the name Rahab, there's a collective, ah, why did you bring her up? She's not even a Jew, and she's got a nickname. Now, again, it's not unusual for us to have nicknames. I've told you before that, you know, when I get uh, solicitations in the mail, and you know, people refer to me. You know, I get you know, you, you won a hundred thousand dollars, you're special ed. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Okay, that's all right. So, let, let me let me just we'll play this nickname game real quick. You just go ahead and shout it right out loud in church if you happen to know it. If you don't, then everybody around you will look at you like, No, that's not the right answer. Okay, uh, like for instance, John. Uh, Baptist, sure, John the Baptist. Uh, Alexander the? Great, Great yeah. Uh, Attila the? Hun. Uh, Conan the? Barbarian, yes. Winnie the? Pooh, yes. Uh, Buffy the? Man, you guys are good. Uh, Jabba the? Hut, yeah. Uh, let's see. And uh, do you know what Rahab's nickname is? Rahab the? Prostitute. Harlot, if you're reading the King James Version, she was a prostitute. Rahab, the prostitute. What? 
She wasn't even Jewish. She was Canaanite. And Canaanites were the enemies of the Jews. So we have this enemy prostitute. I mean, how much worse can you get than an enemy prostitute? I mean, the prostitute's bad enough. We saw Tamar's story last week. And we, now, now we got one from the other group, the enemy, and, and she's still all messed up. What's she doing in the lineage of Jesus? Did Matthew mess up or did he know what he was doing? Why is she in the Christmas story, for heaven's sakes? Because she is part of the story and she is the point of the story. Get it? See, Rahab's line of work earned her a nickname that everyone would remember, but there was more going on in her life than what any, anybody saw from the outside. In Rahab's story, we see that Rahab recognizes that God is in charge. She's got a nickname, she's got a reputation, but she's come to the realization that there is a God and he is in charge. Now, here's the background for how we meet Rahab. Israel had just become a nation. If you remember, they had just left Egypt, where they had been in, then slaves for 400 years. No one in the Jewish community at that time knew how to do anything else but be a slave, because that's what they'd been doing for 400 years. Now, they're coming into the promised land, a land that God promised them, the land that Abraham and Isaac used to live in before they moved down to Egypt and became slaves. Um, and, and so God promised that he'd give that back to them, that land. So they're coming home, essentially. But, but now, instead of being maybe 50 or 100 of them that went down to Egypt in the first place, there's like two or three million of them. This is a herd of folks. They come to the city of Jericho. Perhaps you've heard of Jericho where Rahab lives just by coincidence, perhaps. And Joshua, the leader of Israel, he decides to send in a couple of spies to see what they're up against. And as they're checking things out, somebody sees them and turns them in, says, we got some Jewish boys here and they're here to spy out the land. And as they are checking things out, um, they, they decide that they're going to, uh, you know, stop by Rahab's house. Okay, we don't, it doesn't give any more details about that. So they're seen going into Rahab's house, and the king instructs his men to go get them. So when Rahab's asked about them, she tells them a, a little story. Yes, they were here, but they left just before sundown, just before the gates were locked. And if you hurry, you can catch them. And you always believe the word of a prostitute, right? So they leave, they begin to search. She goes upstairs where the scripture says she had hid these two spies. And she has a little conversation with them after she lies to the, the, the king's men that, that came to get them. And here's what happens. So before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on earth below. Your God is the God. Oh, yeah, we've got little gods that we worship and stuff around here, but your God is large, and he is in charge. I recognize that. Rahab has an amazing amount of faith in a God that she's only heard about. And in her newfound faith, Rahab asks for a little help. 
I know God's in charge. Do you think maybe, do you think maybe he'd help me a little bit? Now then, she says, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. You see what she's doing there? It's kind of how we all start out. Well, if I do this, will you do that? So she's just barely, really new in her faith. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in just happened to be in a, as a part of the city wall. I think that's why they went to her house in the first place. Rahab essentially says, your God saved you. Do you think he'd give us the time of day? Would he save my family too? We're going to trust your God. We believe in your God. So when the spies get back to Joshua after that, they tell him that everyone in Jericho is scared to death because Rahab the prostitute told us so. Okay. And evidently they were pretty convincing because they convinced Joshua, who was the leader of the people at that time. So, and again, what happens next is, again, if you grew up in church, you know this story. You probably saw the flannel graph story or, you know, you, you, you've heard about the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho. You know the song? Joshua with the battle of Jericho. Got that one down? Jericho. All right. So, um, do, do you remember the battle plan for Jericho? Do you remember that whole deal? It's just like very unique. I've never seen, and I don't know that it's ever happened again, like this particular battle plan. But these guys get back to Joshua, and they say, everybody is in Jericho is scared to death. They're probably just going to open the gates and let us in, because they are scared. So here's the battle plan that God gives to Joshua. We're going to walk around Jericho. You don't need to take your... Your, your swords or anything like that. Just, in fact, we're going to have the choir lead us. The choir's going to go first. That's good. You want to sing when you're trying to go to battle. So they're singing, and we want to walk around the whole time. Just walk around it, and then we'll come back. That's all we'll do, day one. And day two, same thing. Day three, four, five, and six, same. Just, we'll just walk around the city just one time. So you can imagine the army commanders going, you smoking something? What's a... What kind of a battle plan? Sounds like a parade, doesn't it? And he says, well, okay, so on the seventh day, seventh day, we'll, we won't just walk around it once. We'll walk around it seven times, and then at the end of that, we'll all yell, hey, heart, the herald, hey, yeah, hey, and the walls will all fall down. You're right. Yeah, the, yeah that's going to happen. Now, again, if, if you grew up in church, you know all about that, and that's really <laughs> what happened. Now, again, it sounded more like a parade, but, but God wanted to be sure. It was, a, it was a plan designed by God so that he got the credit. That happened several times. You know, Gideon was another one, you know, where they weeded out the, the soldiers that they didn't want, and with 300 guys, they were able to do amazing things. Well, this is the same thing. They didn't do diddly squat except for they obeyed God and walked around the city, and then they yelled at the appropriate time. God wanted to be sure that they knew that he was the real deal. So you need to, hey, pay attention. Hey. So they do their walkabout, and on the seventh day, they, the walls come tumbling down. And again, it's just interesting to read in history. Some of you that are history buffs, you can go back, and you can Google Jericho and how the walls fall down. Some of the interesting things, one guy said that it was the choir that led them, and their singing was so bad, the walls fell down. <laughs> Have you ever heard a choir like that? Okay, um, someone said that the shouting was so loud that the reverberation caused the walls to collapse. It was just, it was reverberation. They just didn't know what to call it back then. But all that two million people yelling, that was a lot of noise and those poor walls couldn't handle it. 
Maybe, okay. Another guy said they marched around so many times with so many people that it eroded the ground. They just did a moat around it, the whole thing, and on the walls fell into the moat, kind of. Maybe. Um, and I don't know if you care about this, but do, do you want to know what I think happened? Yes, Pastor, we want to know what you think happened. This is not in the scripture, okay? So this is just what I think probably happened. Again, uh, you'll have to ask Rahab when you get there, and when you run up to her, you can say, "Hey, Rahab, you're the the gal that God used to to save His people." But maybe she could tell you. But I think I think they walked around the wall the first time. People are curious inside, and so that what what do you do when you're curious? You climb up on the wall and watch. Okay, and by the seventh day, by the time they're walking around the seventh time, I think the whole town crawled up on the wall to see what these clowns were doing out there walking around. And then when they yelled, they, people got scared and fell off the wall, and the wall came. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. I think they overpowered, they overweighted the wall. I think just, you know, hundreds of thousands of people crawled up on a wall that was never designed to have. So, I don't know what happened. But anyway, that's, that makes sense. Maybe God sent a nuke. Okay, and they just blew the whole thing up. Anyway, there was chaos, there was destruction, it was, it was a, just a mess. But in the midst of all the destruction, God, in his providence, reaches down and spares one family. God spares Rahab's family because of her faith. She believed that God could do it. That's what she asked God to do. Here's how it happened. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. And then verse 25. Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And now get this. This is probably worth the whole, the, the whole story right here. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. And she lives among them as a picture of someone that was still way outside of their way of thinking. That God is a God of mercy and grace who would even spare an outsider, an enemy, a woman with a very telling nickname. Why is she even in the story? She's the point of the story. The Bible doesn't tell us that, that one, this story, but one day, Rahab, as she was doing her chore or living her life after this, after the battle of Jericho and everything, a man named Solomon came over to her and asked her to go out on a date. Hey, you want to go get dinner? Hey, you want to do something? something you know, how do relationships get started? So Solomon asks her out on a date. Uh, he's a Jewish man, and he asks Rahab, the prostitute, a Canaanite woman, they, they, they spend time together, they get to know each other, they fall in love, they get married, and the Bible does say that they have a little baby boy, and they name that little baby boy Boaz. That's a cute little name, huh? Boaz. But Boaz, when he grows up, and it's, in fact, in his later years, Boaz Rahab's son marries Ruth. But Ruth has a nickname too. Ruth the Moabite. Ooh, you know about the Moabites, don't you? They're worse than mosquito bites or termites or any of them. The Moabites were bad people. They, they uh, sacrificed their children to their God. They were idol worshipers, and they tried to lead the Israelis uh, astray and tried to you know, invite them into different ways of worshiping lots of different gods. I mean, these were just some bad people. Ruth, the Moabite, surely nothing good 
could come from Moab. And you read about the story of Moab. It's just like, and yet it's Boaz and Ruth's great-grandson who is actually King David. God used this Moabite and this prostitute in the lineage of Jesus. Matthew included Rahab and Ruth in the story because their stories illustrate the entire message of Jesus. That outsiders, lawbreakers, those with nicknames are all invited to be a part of Jesus' family. No one is too bad for God. It's the Christmas story. And maybe their story is not that far away from your story and mine. Because just as they each had a nickname, Rahab the prostitute, Ruth the Moabite, we all have a nickname. And many times we don't want anybody to know what that nickname is. Some of us may be trying to keep our nicknames a secret. Only a few people really know who you are. When you're all alone, when you're having a bad day, and you, you feel pretty good about not very many people knowing about who you are, what really makes you tick. Maybe you're ashamed of your nickname, and you just want to move on from it and say, no, that, that, I'm, I'm not that person very often. I'm different, and maybe you are. Maybe you aren't. Sometimes our nicknames are because of habits that we have or actions that we take. We might be like Gary the Greedy or George the Glutton or Les the Luster or Charlie the Cheater or James the Jerk or Adam the addict, or Barry the abuser, and the list goes on and on and on. And we all have a nickname. Matthew had a nickname too. You remember Matthew's nickname? Matthew the tax collector. And in those days, that was the worst of the worst. These were traitors turning on their own people, working for a foreign government. They were horrible people. And Matthew wanted to remind all of us that no matter what our nickname might be, that Jesus' invitation continues to be the same. Follow me. Follow me. I don't care what your nickname is. I can work with that. I can work with you if you'll put your trust in me. Jesus didn't tell Matthew, you need to go clean up your act first. You need to sell your tax collecting business. You need to quit sinning. You need to straighten things up and then come follow me. He just said, follow me. Let, let me help you make the changes that you will need to make in your life in order to be the very best you that you can be. And Matthew did that. And, and so can you and I. We start with right where we're at because Christmas says that I love you just the way you are, even if you have a nickname and it's not very flattering. God has done for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He's already done that. He came to be your Savior. That's the story of Christmas. Make that Christmas connection. Same Jesus that was born in a manger died on the cross for you. It's the same story. Joy to the world, that's you, joy to you, the Lord has come. Let earth, again, that's you, let earth receive her king. Let every heart, again, that's you and me, let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature will sing. Is there room in your life for the Savior of the world? That's what Christmas is all about, that Jesus came for you and me. Have you made room for him? I hope you have. I hope you've invited him to be a part of your life. And, and if you haven't, that you could do that right now. You don't have to wait for something else to happen. Wait for Christmas to happen. We talk about, what are you waiting for, Christmas? 
Okay, Christmas is here. You don't have to wait for that anymore. For you to invite Jesus to come into your life, just like God invited, uh, uh, that Rahab invited God to take care of her family, to save her family. God's in the saving business. And so, uh, again, if you've been a part of Journey Church, you know here in just a minute, I'm going to stop talking and just give you a minute of silence just for you to talk to God, anything you want to say to God. And I would hope that if you have not yet invited Jesus into your life, you do that. Lord, for, for Christmas this year, would you just, would you come into my life? I, I'm making room. I'm opening the door to my life to you. I, I want you to come into my life. I hope you'll do that. And if you've already done that, then perhaps this little prayer will help you. Or again, if, if this is today is the day when you're saying, today I'm opening up my life. I'm preparing room for him today. But this little, little prayer, I'll read it, and then I'll have you read it out loud with me if you choose to do that. This little prayer says, teach me to live my life according to who you say I am, forgiven, accepted, loved. Would you read that with me out loud? Teach me to live my life according to who you say I am, forgiven, accepted, and loved. Now, again, I want to just give you a minute. You might just pray that prayer in this next minute as you talk to God. But I, I hope that if today's the day you're saying, I get it. I understand what Christmas is about, and I want to make room in my heart for Jesus today. You do that. So I'll be quiet for a minute. You answer that question. What, 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 what do you need to say to God? Say it to him right now, and then I'll close in prayer here in just a minute. Lord, I just want to thank you for this moment. Some of us in this room today or have just invited you to come into our lives for the very first time. And boy, that's exactly what you want for us because you have the best in store for us if we'll just trust you with our lives. God, I pray that you would bless those folks as they make that step this Christmas to invite you to come into their lives. Others of us are praying this little prayer, teach me to live my life according to who you say I am, forgiven, accepted, and loved. And Lord, we need that because not, not only do we have a nickname given to us by others, but we also tend to label ourselves and limit ourselves and even condemn ourselves with names. Well, I can't do that. I'm too this. I'm too that. Lord, I thank you for forgiving and for accepting each one of us, for loving each one of us. And Lord, I pray that as we go through this Christmas season, we would be reminded of that over and over. And it's not about the manger. It's not about the wise men. It's not about those are all pieces of the puzzle of you drawing people to yourself. We're the reason for, for you coming. You came to be our Savior. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to uh, give you that first place in our lives, to invite you to come into our lives um, this, this day and this season and for the rest of our lives. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thanks for not giving up on us. Thanks for not giving up on Rahab, for not giving up on Ruth, for not giving up on Matthew, for not giving up on me. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I pray, God, that you would help us to walk in your grace, your amazing grace, as we walk out of this room here in just a few minutes. And Lord, may this Christmas really be a, 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 a joy-filled Christmas as we make room in our hearts for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thanks for this story. Thank you again for placing this genealogy in the Bible so that we could read it and learn from it. God, we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen.